Someone walking with me.
Put a lot of sunshine in those dark places if you're letting today. Turn, turn around. Let's stand. Let's welcome each other. Let's worship together today.
Let's see if I can hear you shout this morning. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway. Clouds will overspread the sky, but we're traveling. Days are over, not a shadow, not a sight. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toys of life repay when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Rise before us, and soon his beauty will be home. <coughs> gates will open, shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Jesus will sing and shout the victory.
Before you come forward, I just want to make mention that with your donations and willingness to pack a box, you are looking at approximately 400 boxes that have been packed. So I think the Lord and his work de deserves a round of applause for <laughs> To you and me, we just put stuff in a box because we were compelled to do so. But I believe that each one of these boxes in its own special way, has a destination to reach. And that's by the hand of the Lord that will be on each box. Amen. So this dedication is just an outward demonstration that we put these hands or these boxes and turn them over to the Lord, that they are delivered each in its own special way. So if you'll come forward, you and your family, we have the children's church up here to kind of come forward first. But if you will come and gather around, I will turn it over and Mike is going to lead us in prayer over these boxes. If anyone wants to join. Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is, Lord, to, to be a part of this ministry. And dear Lord, we just thank you for, for allowing us to, to give and to be a, po a part of what you have in store. And we just pray, God, a special blessing for every one of these boxes, not only the 400 that we have, but all across this nation, Lord. There are people uh, giving and donating, and we just pray, God, to, that your will can be done and that you have a special place for each box and a special child, Lord. And Lord, we know you love the children, and, and Heavenly Father, we do too. And once again, we just thank you for allowing us to be a part of this. And just, uh, Lord, I know each box has been packed with uh, physical items, but also, Lord, with love and joy. And we just pray, God, when these are received, Lord, that each child will receive a special blessing and come to know you, Lord, in the free pardon of sin. And Lord, we just pray, God, once again, that uh, you will direct and lead and guide and be with these boxes and send them all across the world and give us an opportunity, Lord, to worship and to give back to you through these boxes. And Lord, we just pray for the receiver, God, that these children, Lord, that you will continue to bless and, and work in their lives and let them be a godly example once they receive these boxes. And we just ask these things in your name. Amen. Even the video would kind of touch our hearts, would it not? You see those uh, kids and uh, growing up at uh, a very young age, my father taught me a lesson. My brother was three years older than I and he was getting into a few things he should not. And as we sat at the table, he, he not being present, I was kind of reiterating how my brother was. 
And my father looked at me and he said, you know, Philip, you could be Alan and he could be you. So uh, egotistical uh, righteousness uh, kind of changed right there at the table. And that was a great lesson. And as I look at some of those children, I say, one of us could be them, they could be us with the many blessings that we have here. But you have uh, shown compassion and uh, I would suppose and hope that that was the Lord's guidance today because I want to uh, talk to you on that particular subject. But first of all, I want to thank you for your welcome and I'm certainly glad to see you. I was beginning to think that uh, Dr. Burgess never was going to leave again. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, I'm beginning to believe that he thinks he's the interim pastor here. <laughs> also, I want to verify that uh, the television is being watched by some. I ran into uh, my uh, friend, uh, matter of fact, it was at, uh, at the uh, Cracker Barrel in Somerset of all places, and Brother Paul Stanley and his wife came in, and we exchanged, and he said, uh, Philip, he said, uh, when you were at New Haven, I saw you on television. And I said, oh, you did? And he said, yeah, but I didn't get much out of it. <laughs> How would you like to have a friend like that? <laughs> he said, but I will say, and, and all of you, I think most of you would remember his father, uh, just wonderful preacher. He said one time that he told him when he was very young, he's talking about not getting much out of a sermon. And he said, well, what you need to do is look inside and see how much you're putting into it. So that helped me a little bit, you know, coming on. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you will, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And our text will be found in uh, beginning reading with uh, uh, verse 9, please. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of of perfectness. The subject is seeking godliness. What is it really to be godly? And of course, when we say godly, we mean, the word itself means God-like, God-likeness, which means to have and possess his characters, his characteristics. And so that's, that is the, the overall meaning of what it is to be godly. Probably one of the very quick answers that we would give would say, well, a godly person is somebody who doesn't sin. And, uh, and, and that's right. Also, it's, uh, it, it has a meaning that when you talk about one to another, of course, a little introspection kind of destroys and makes us very humble, but, but that ought to be our goal, of course, to be godlike. And that's what Paul is talking about here in our text, that, that we don't sin. 
But then, that's not the whole of it. You know, we need to look at our Christian life. Uh, just uh, suppose there are many examples, but let me give you this one. It's like a portrait, a, a picture, a painting that an artist has done. And when someone looks at it, we may say, oh, that, that's beautiful. Whether it's a landscape or whatever it is, that's a beautiful painting. And we just take kind of the whole in. But the artist just didn't do it that way. He took a little bit of blue and mixed in a little white and, and he used colors and he began to blend them in and to contrast them sometimes and all. But that together made the whole beautiful picture or painting. And so that's the way a Christian life is. We, we look at the whole as it were we look at someone who's a Christian and, and we can identify them. We might even say something about how loving they are or uh, whatever adjectives we want to use. But while you and I look at the whole picture, God, the creator, and that's what he's saying here, is that he sees the different tones, the, the different paintings, the the different colors that are mixed in. So to not sin is really one thing, and he speaks to that, what, what we ought not. And the picture here is he's looking as like it's clothing that we take off some and we put on some. And Paul speaks to that not only here, he does also in Ephesians. If, if you uh, uh, just look at where we are right here uh, in verse 5, or I'll read it to you, but, but here's the take off situation. Mortify, put to death your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now you put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds." So there's the whole list and how does that fit our culture and the culture in which you and I live and how does it fit our own lives and livings. I mean, you know, if you want to spend some time and just look into our lives and to look at this, we can begin to read that very list and oh, how that fits the culture in which we live also, even that the wrath of God will fall upon it. Of course, the world's not paying any attention to it, very much, unless the Holy Spirit brings conviction and He does that through the ministry of the church and the gospel of Christ because we have an answer, which is Jesus. But even looking into our lives, He says, you, you've put this off. And so Philip has to stop and say, well, let me check the list. Have I put this off? And uh, so like anger and wrath and malice and Filthy communication and blasphemy, lie. Oh, you know, okay, we try to deal with those, and rightly so. Now, that's good, and we need to, but the tendency is there is that that's just half the painting, is that we, we deal with that, but we don't overall perhaps put much emphasis on what we're to put on. And so that's our concern here this morning, is that we look not just what we take off, because that's a battle, I know, and we deal with that, but also when we speak of having the character of God, there are those things that we need to put on and to clothe well. And so once again, he begins to give us a list, and we've read it in our text. When we begin uh, verse 12, uh, you know, holy and beloved. So here's the way he starts. He says, put on, therefore, 
as the elect of God, the favored ones of God, uh, the very chosen of God and His grace and mercy. And this is what we, we're saved and we know Christ and it's been by His grace and His mercy. And notice that it says, holy, separated unto me. Uh, Brother Brown was teaching that this morning. It's always amazing me what Sunday school does and when that's God's word, the Bible. You talk about one thing, it's all over. And, and that's what we're talking about, being separated and we're separated unto God. The words used is sanctification. That's what saint means. When we say saint so-and-so, or was he a saint? Well, that means he's separated unto God. And uh, so... This is what he's speaking to. You and I, by God's grace, have been favored, we've been saved, and also we've been set apart. And then he says, and beloved. That means beloved by God. He loves us. He loves us. And we ought to personalize that. I remember as a boy when in Bible school, say John three sixteen, for God so loved the world, and the teachers say, oh, stop right there. Let's say it again, and I want you to put your name. And she might not have known, but she did know. She was trying to personalize us to that. For God so loved Philip, you put your name there. So it's not just a generic thing. It's, it's very personal. So he writes to them and says, and you're beloved of God. He loves you. And then he begins to list the clothing that we ought to put on. Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Uh, if you have a quarrel, uh, forgive for Christ forgave you, and above all, put on charity. Now, the temptation for the preacher or teacher is, but for all of us as we read that, let, let's just look at the whole thing. Well, that's probably what we do when we just, you know, read it without studying. We read all those and say, okay, the, this is the attributes, this is the character of God, and this is what we ought to have. But rather than do that this morning, I just want to begin with the first. And, and let's just give our thought to this. Notice what he says. Come. Verse 12 again. Let me read it. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, separated unto God, loved by God, Bows of mercy. Bows of mercy. Now what's that mean? The Greek word is a word that really means intestines. So, you know, we just got a point right in here. And uh, the enigmatic uh, word uh, of English would be compassion. You know, we don't always use the word very nicely, but somebody once in a while uh, kind of in a turmoil and say, well, my gut feeling is, uh, that's not a good expression to children, but I'm just saying, what was we're trying to say? This is what I feel in here. And so the word in, in English comparable to bowels of mercy means compassion, tenderness, pity. And beloved, I don't mind, and I'm not patronizing you, but when I saw that this morning, and I know there are other sister churches dealing with this, you, you're showing compassion. You, you're taking some time. You're taking some effort to show a blessing and love and life to others and to those who are less fortunate than we are. And so this, this is what is going on here. So the, the first clothing, and I don't know if there was any particular order Paul was given, but we're, this is before us. And he says, you, you put on compassion. And what does that mean? Well, as you know, passion, uh, we even talk about around Easter, the passion of Christ. Talk, what does that mean? The suffering, suffering. And co, uh, where you're cooperative together, or corporation together, Compassion means suffering with. And so when you have compassion with someone, you suffer with them. So I ask myself, you know, do I have that much concern? Do I have anybody on my heart? When I look at a prayer list, am I suffering with them? Suffering with them? 
Uh, Jesus used this word himself. And let me just uh, turn over to the Gospel of Matthew. And you know this passage well uh, because it is a very missionary passage that we often use in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. He was working hard, religiously, so to speak, reverently. He was healing. He was teaching. He, he was bringing in the kingdom of God. You know the word kingdom means rule. He was bringing in the rule of God in him. He was the rule of God. He, he was touching people's lives. He was teaching godliness. He was teaching salvation even. He was teaching and healing. He was bringing in the rule of God. But he was looking around and says, and he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. And the Greek word there means they were harassed. The people were being harassed and often being harassed religiously. You know, it was kind of a damnation, hellfire preaching all the time, just with no hope, with no answer, that they were, and they were fainted. They, they were on them, compassion on them because they fainted. They were harassed and were scattered abroad, thrown down, literally. They were thrown down, people. And beloved, we look around us. Are there those harassed? Are they given to it? Are they thrown down? Because why? As sheep having no shepherd. That's why this is such a missionary. And then he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. So that's the contemplation. Do I have this real compassion? You know, a church, I, I know we talk about missions, and that's how wonderful that is, but we can, can become isolated. But compassion, compassion acts. And all of us can look at ourselves about this. You know, I, I can preach it, but Philip has to say, but do you exercise it? And does it venture to action within your life? That's what he's talking about. And of course, the, the definition of our Lord teaching was especially, and you know this, and I'll, I'll not labor it, but it's worthy to understand how our Lord defined compassion himself. So I flip over here to that little, little story that you know. It was a parable. It was a question about the Good Samaritan. And I simply touch upon it. It reads like this. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. There he is. Some of us, by the grace of God, have been to Jerusalem. We've been on the road to Jericho. And it is just a winding road and a big boulders are up. And I mean, when I read this, it just comes to my mind because men could have been standing behind, you can't see, and all of a sudden you come and there, and, and it, it is still a barren road, and it's on the way down, and it's coming up. And so when he says this in the priest, the priest came down a certain way by chance, oh, just happened to be. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. That's the question. That's the easy thing to do, is to pass by. Yeah, I know they're hurt. Sometimes, sometimes people call, or they call you, or ask and say that we need some help. Or do, do, we, do we act? Are we really to help? I'm not intruding here or imposing. I do think every church ought to have a benevolence fund and to be able to reach out and to help. And there are other organizations, and I thank God for that. But, you know, so that times that people hurt. 
And I know it's, it's difficult sometimes because we want to become a detective. And we may do that personally. Somebody asks for help and say, well, you know, they may go around asking everybody for help. Well, uh, that detective work is not ours. Ours is to suffer with. They need help. They need to hand out whatever they need. But here, somebody is very religious. And so those who give spiritual guidance have to look at themselves. And then he said, you remember a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by. And there's all kinds of excuses, uh, even in some of the commentaries, which is not good because you're imposing on Scripture. He just passed by. The, the priest, he's not supposed to touch a dead body. Uh, he's supposed to give forth. Besides, he's got ministerial duties being, and here comes the Levite, and they were maintenance. The priest, they, they were the children of, of Aaron, and uh, the Levites uh, of the Levi tribe, and they, they kept the mount, maintenance of the tabernacle and the temple. And so he saw him, but he looked on him and passed by on the other side. <coughs> now here comes the Samaritan. And the Samaritan, and who is he? You recall when uh, the uh, children of uh, Judah were taken captive and uh, they were for 70 years. That was about 586 B.C. But even in 722 B.C., the northern tribes, 10 northern tribes called Israel, Judah, they were taken north. And what they did was they assimilated with the people. And so they became half Jew and half Gentile. And they were hated by the Jews. Yeah, nobody liked them. The people of Samaria, Samaritans, half-breeds, Jews. And he comes by and he sees this Jew. Now Jesus is telling us, remember, and he says what? And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He suffered with him and went to him, bound his wounds, put oil and wine, put him on his beast, brought him to an inn, took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave the host, take care of him. And whenever you spend, when I come, I will come back and pay you. You mean, yeah. Don't have a little money on this. Compassion, cost, sacrifice. But isn't that the character of God? He looked on you and me and he had compassion. And what did he say? Well, I've got compassion on you. You're on your way to hell. You've been disobedient. No. He said, what, what does it take to care for them, to keep them, to cleanse them? to make them compatible in companionship and a relationship. And it took the death of his son. He gave his son Jesus, and he died for you and for me. That was the prize, to take care of us even into eternity and eternal life in compassion with him. That's the compassion. Took it. This one who nobody loved, have compassion on him. Now remember where this was heading. When he said take off and put on, he said here, verse 10, and have put on the new man, I'm back in our text, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Here's the picture. Here's the whole painting. But this is just one little part of it but it's an important part to make the whole compassion. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision, uncircumcision, barbarian, Cynthia, bond, free, but Christ is all in all. It doesn't matter whether he's white or black. It doesn't matter whether he's a Muslim or a Christian. It doesn't matter whether he's a Democrat or a Republican. It doesn't matter whether he's poor or whether he's rich. It doesn't matter if he has no education or if he has all the education. 
Jesus said, it doesn't matter. It is anyone who is in need, you and I. And that's where the question came, you'll recall. Because the whole question came by this dear man who said, well, who is my neighbor? Testing Jesus. He was a lawyer. He understood the Bible, the Old Testament. He knew it all. And Jesus was saying, love, love your neighbor as yourself. You take care of yourself? Yeah, pretty good. Well, then take care of your neighbor. Well, who is my neighbor, he said. And that's why he came to this, this very story. He said, I'll tell you who your neighbor is. Is anybody that's in need. We might not always condone all the way of life and all that's going on. And again, one more I'll put in parentheses because I don't want you to think that I'm, I, it's one thing to preach this. It's another thing to exercise it in our lives and to be God-like. But this is what he's teaching us. Compassion, compassion. So let me ask you and let me encourage you and let me encourage myself. Be careful. You see, clothing really isn't so easy, is it? Sometimes we can say, well, I, I've got to quit lying. I've got to quit doing this. I, I need to quit watching this and all these kind of things. But this putting on, we can just kind of assume, well, I, this is what I am. But am I? So let's begin there. Having compassion, which is to be Christ-like. To be like that as a church, the body of Christ, the incarnation of Jesus on this earth, or personally, or my family, to have the compassion of Jesus Christ. Now, dear friend, while I've been talking and sharing the Word of God together, prayer, concern, you may be without Christ. You may be outside of a relationship with God. Your life might be full of these things that we've read. And as he has said to us, in whom you also walked sometime when you lived in them. And I hope that's true. And I want you to know that we're not above that. And we have to deal with that each day in our lives. And, and when we fail, by God's grace, we can come to him and ask him for forgiveness and for cleansing. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But he treats us as a child. And you can be a child too. And this, this price that we were talking about and the giving of his son Jesus was to die for our life and living the way we lived and the what we are. And that is we're sinners. We rebel. We, we haven't taken Jesus. And, and the, the gospel is this, that you look at yourself and you say, well, yes, you know, a lot of that's in my life and I've sinned. But what do I do? Well, Christ has died for your sins. That's what is the gospel. He, he, he's taken care of that. He became your and my substitute. He took the wrath of God. The penalty fell on him. The punishment fell on him. Well, what's the matter? Well, here's what God's word says. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's Jesus. Will you put your life and your trust in Jesus? You can do that this morning. Or if God is speaking to your heart in some other way, speaking to your heart, you want to share, you want to pray, whatever. Let God have his way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
We do thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy. We praise you, Father, for your goodness. And beloved, Father, we pray because sometimes as a church, we know how to reach out to lost sinners, but sometimes we don't know how to restore a fallen brother or sister. So we pray even today, Father, for those about us because we've all fallen. Sometimes it's more public than other. But Father, Christ gave us a compassion for restoration, to restore. So as a church and as a people of God, help us to have that kind of love for those, Father, who who've kind of lingered on the way and once again to know that could be us and they could be. So, Father, just forgive us of our sins. Help us to have compassionate heart as Christ. And we know that we need thy blessing, thy spirit, and the renewing of our mind constantly in the word of God. We give thee praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to close the service this morning this way. But after I got out of college, I joined uh, the service in the Army, and I was uh, in a time of peace. The Korean War had uh, been over for about six months. So I never had to go to war. But I've never been insensitive to know that the reason I didn't have to is because others gave of themselves, some their lives, some the hurt the rest of their lives. And uh, so I'm thankful. I know we've had an emphasis on Veterans Day. And uh, so I'd just like to ask uh, all the veterans here this morning, if you would, I'd like for you to come down here and uh, stand with me, please. Would you? I want to embarrass you. Just come, yes, if you would. Whatever service you were in, you've just come and stand with me this morning. I want to thank God for these folks, and I know that you do. Thankful for their service and the giving in our country in which we live. And uh, we should not say lightly the freedoms we have because, oh, beloved, how God has so blessed us. And uh, I know there's much confusion today, and, and uh, yet there are still those young men and women who are abroad or at home who are giving of themselves to serve our country and to keep the freedoms that we've had and God is so blessed. And so I want to thank these brothers and sisters and I know you do on your behalf, uh, thank them and keep them in our prayers with those who are serving today of giving of themselves. Let's pray, please. Oh, Father in heaven, there's no pretense before Thee. We are thankful, Father, for these brothers and sisters that have given of themselves in these past years in the service of our country. Father, it behooves us to remember men and women in service today, some abroad and in dangerous places, away from home, but the desire, Father, ever to serve a country which, Father, we're thankful for. And we bring the heads of our nation in prayer to give them direction of mind and heart and to settle all hearts that, Father, our desire would be to honor, to glorify thee, to please thee. 
so as the tragic atmosphere of our nations. We just pray, Father, for folks like these who stand here this morning and perhaps others here this morning who have relatives, sons or daughters, cousins, friends, keeping in their prayers. We ask for your blessed hand, and yes, Father, we do ask for your protection. So just keep us. We give thee thanksgiving and praise, and Father, just help us to live lives that glorify thee and praise thy holy name. For we ask, we pray, we give thanksgiving in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen, amen. and amen. God bless you. Come by. Give these folks a handshake.